And welcome back. We are live here at the Dot Conf 2012 uh, in beautiful Las Vegas at the Cosmopolitan Hotel. This, of course, is Splunk's annual user conference. I'm Jeff Kelly with Wikibon.org. I'm joined here by my co-host, Jeff Frick from SiliconANGLE. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We've had a full day here at the conference uh, with a lot of great speakers. We've had customers. We've had the CEO with the CMO. But now we're going to cut right to the chase. We've got the crazy founders. Uh, we're happy to have them on board. I think everybody's a little punchy at the end of the day. But that's okay. That's the way we like it. So we've got Eric Swan and Rob Doss joining us. Uh, it's quite a, quite a run. Quite a run you guys have, have sat through, right? Seven and a half years since the beginning uh, of this adventure? Probably closer to ten. Closer yeah. to ten? Yeah, I mean, seven and, seven and a half. Uh, Eight ten, fun ten because once we kind of came off our other job, we, we didn't know what we wanted to do. But we were sitting around trying to figure out what it was we were going to do for, for a long time before we even kind of honed in on anything. So... I think it was closer to 10 years. Closer to 10. Yeah. Yeah. Funded yeah. almost eight years. Funded eight years ago. Right. Funded eight years ago. Yeah. Yep. And how did you hone in on, well, back up. How, how did you pick the word Splunk? <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there, there's two parts to this. There's why Splunk and then how do we get it. The, the difference between the 10 years and eight years that Rob's sort of alluding to is there's a two-year period of time when we tried to figure it out. This isn't our first rodeo. Uh, we've done startups before. And we thought this time around, we'd spend a little more time up front doing the homework. And I think, I, just honestly, one of the reasons that I think we're sitting here today in a, with a healthy company that's, that's doing well is because we did a bunch of homework up front. And we can go into lengthy detail of what that was. One of the things we did is we talked to lots of customers. And we came apart the, uh, upon the problem by talking to people. And one of the things that we heard people talk about was they had this massive amount of data. And that when they went looking through it, it was a lot like cave diving. That literally it was this big, ugly muck of data. And you put on your hip waders and your headlamp and you sort of went into the cave looking blindly for stuff. And they would, to our recollection, they actually used the word splunking my data. I don't mm -hmm. know that that's true oh, okay. and we're post-rationalizing or whether we're <laughs> making that up. But a couple of interesting things is, is Splunk then as a, you know, we're very brand sensitive. That Splunk is a little like Google. It's a misspelling of a slightly geeky or weird term, like Google and Google. Are, are, are misspellings. And it can be used as an adjective or a verb or a noun. No, no, I guess you can't use it as a noun. Well, probably, you might want to look that up in the net to figure out what a no, I'm not, noun is. I'm not the guy but, you want to by the way, our, English our grammar investors questions hated spot. the name. <laughs> and it took a lot of convincing to, I mean, they're like, enterprise software company called Splunk? Are you guys nuts? But when you think about it, it was kind of like, almost like the consumerization of enterprise software at this point in time. So it was entirely on purpose that we picked a name that was catchy. Really, slightly really, inappropriate. Yeah, yeah, I mean, all, it's slightly inappropriate and everything, just so that it was unforgettable. And it didn't sound like other enterprise software companies. Because mm. we really wanted to focus at, at you know, end users, not C-level folks, and kind of a turning around of the enterprise sales model at that point in time. Right. And I think the name fit really well with that. Whether you like it or hate it, you're going to remember it. Wait, right? exactly. and when you're, when you're a, Two-person yeah. company. One of the things you struggle yeah. struggle with is just a brand that people will remember. And right. you know, you, you you'll remember it. Yeah, absolutely. Picking a name is one of the worst things you can do. It's right. start. It's a very hateful right. process. It sucks. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think you guys hit on a good one. Um, so what's interesting is so this is like almost ten years ago. So this is before the term big data was yeah. popular yeah. or even coined probably. Right. So, but nevertheless. You're still dealing with, I mean, big data is relative, so mm -hmm. even then you were dealing with pretty large data volumes. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, the industry is now kind of caught up with you. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us a little bit about kind of that big data evolution from the time you started and how that's kind of changed um, over the last 10 years and how Splunk's mission has likewise had to kind of adapt into mm -hmm. this new world that we were calling, you know, the big data mm -hmm. era. Well, I mean, so literally from the day that we wrote the first part of the code, it was really, really slow. So it couldn't consume big data if it tried. But it was obvious that you could see, if you were using it, what the potential was if you could stick a lot of data into it. And our fabulous engineering staff of people a lot smarter than Eric and I spent a lot of time just honing it, like squeezing water out of a rock, release after release after release after release, um, and we never thought about big data. We never thought, at first we didn't even think we had anything to do with analytics. And, um, you know, we came up with the re reporting stuff, but it was, you know, I don't even think that I was interested in doing reporting early on. It didn't make sense to me. I'm just like, 
come on, everything's about search. It's all about search, not the reporting. It turns out the reporting was a very critical piece. But um, now it's big data. And, and I think we're, we were very lucky that somebody came up with the term big data right at the time. Somebody put a name about this, uh, around this. And we didn't, we had never even thought that, it didn't even make sense to us. All of a sudden, somebody put, put it into a category and we just fell right into it. Right. I think that's kind of the way that it, it, it happened. It never really was a thought. <laughs> success, we, we, you know, success is often luck. Right yeah. time, right place. We've done companies and been it's just off the wrong, mm -hmm. you know, the wrong place at the right, wrong time. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, we, you know, I don't think we ever thought of ourselves, and maybe today even big data, we're a machine data company. Mm -hmm. We started with machine data. And it just so sure happens to be that machine data is often big data. But we're, right. we've started out as machine data. We've always been interested in, uh, I mean, one of the reasons why we went after sort of the Google search model was is we, early on, we did to machine data what Google did to human generated data. So the analogy has been the human generated content's growing, I guess your, your cameras are like this, right? It's going this fast. Machine generated data, we had these graphs from early on. Mm -hmm. And now they're big data graphs, but early on they were machine data graphs. Mm -hmm. and, you had tools like Google for dealing with human-generated content to find something, but you didn't have the analogous tool for the machine data. Mm -hmm. And what you're finding is this sort of maybe 40-year revolution going on where machine data is becoming extremely valuable, just like human-generated content. Mm -hmm. And over the next period of years, you're going to see everything's throwing off data, whether it's airplanes and cars and buses or whether it's medical devices. Everything's going to be throwing off data, mm -hmm. yet there's no tool effectively like a Google or another, you know, any kind of tool to deal with that massive amount of information. So we're sort of like, Google looks up there, uh, we, we look down here, we index it all and allow you to dig through it. And I think that's, and that's where the revolution's occurring, right? I think right. there's a slower, slightly less visible resolution going on with the fact that all those machines, the only way this is gonna scale is, is if, if machines get a little bit more intelligent, whether you're remote controlling thermostats or whether you're dealing with cars that are getting more intelligent or buildings that are smarter, right. that's our place in the world. Now, what's interesting, and you said you've, you've done some startups, and, and I think a lot of us have, and probably a lot of our viewers have been at various startups, and, and you always hope it's your last startup and it works, but, but oftentimes it doesn't work out that way. So now that, that it worked out, and it sounds like you haven't really had a pivot point, you, you've basically been to grow off kind of the original idea, which is spectacular, but you know, now you've got the new challenges of growing the company, you know, maintaining a culture that you guys obviously, um, you know, you've got some personality, you know, mm -hmm. you're excited about who you are and what the company's at, but you've got to grow it. With, with new leadership or extra leadership and just a lot more people. And now you've, you kind of by de facto getting out uh, are the leader in the space, right? You, you've, there is a category now, big data, and you are kind of the leader. Um, how has that kind of changed things? Or, or how does that kind of, do you feel an added responsibility to kind of lead the charge and, and take it places uh, where no one's really thought of it going before? Or you just keep you just keep doing your thing and having fun and coming up with some of the greatest uh, titles I've seen at any company that I've uh, that's involved it. with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. That was the answer to a very long question. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, well, we uh, yeah. you know I mean the, as, as far as the culture is concerned, Eric, Eric and I and um, uh, we, we in previous companies that we have founded or been very early members of have created a very similar culture, and it was really nice to see that culture sort of grow to a much larger. I think it's really difficult to keep culture like that because as you, when we first started, we were hiring people that were just like us. You know, crazy, listening to the same kind of music, doing the same kind of thing, enjoying the same kind of stuff. And after a while, you can't do that anymore because there's not a lot of those people around. <laughs> they just started up. And, uh, <laughs> you hired them all. Yeah, you're, hiring, you're hiring different people, different cultures. They, you know, some of them are quieter, some of them aren't. And, and, and how do you how do you maintain you know a, a company with all these diverse people? You have to you have to find diversity in people. You can't get everybody that's all the same. Right. And so how do you maintain the culture? It's hard. You know, I mean, there are certain as long as we keep people around from the old days that remember the way that the company was, I think that they can continue to hold that, you know, to, to hold that as they as they keep hiring people. It's totally important to keep that culture around. And I think that's one of the one of probably the largest reasons that. Splunk is successful is because of that culture. We have people that are working that, that are, that are working here longer than they've ever worked anywhere in their lives. We have people that came out of school. This is it was their first job, and now they've been here six, seven years. Um, I think that's a testament to uh, to the culture, and I think yeah. that's you know, like I said, probably the most important thing about building a company that's like this. Yeah, absolutely, and you can tell that the employees here really mm -hmm. feel connection. Absolutely, they are really invested in this company, and I wonder, um, you know. We often hear about, it's very easy to understand what a company does, but not always why they do it. Um, what is your 
mission? I mean, why do you do what you do? Why is it so important? Uh, you know, we know it's machine generated data, getting insights from that data, but why is it important for you? And, and how do you keep everyone so engaged? <laughs> um, well, I think, personally, I think hiring people like Godfrey Sullivan and the rest of the staff is, is totally critical. It's not about, it's not me keeping people engaged, it's not Eric keeping people engaged, it's, it's hiring the best of the best and then, and then enjoying the success of that, right? So, how many of these people that have been here seven years would stick around if the company wasn't doing well? I don't know, that's a really, really good question, right? <laughs> I mean, you can, you can drink beer and have cocktails yeah. all, all day long yeah. at other companies, too. Yeah, there's a lot, too. Of, there's a lot of that going on in the south of the market these days. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, think, I think the initial idea still has a lot of legs. The, the, uh, the customers that have not adopted this technology, there's so many of them still out there that don't even understand it yet. So. Even with what we have today, I think that we can grow this to a really large company. But that doesn't mean that you stand still. So, right. mm -hmm. and then we used to have up on the walls that we're only at mile three of the marathon. Mm -hmm. It really feels like you're in the middle of the game, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't. Mm -hmm. We're not done. It's not done. No, 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 done. You're not a, maybe right. even a quarter of the way done yet. Yeah. And I think a lot of people feel that. Like we're just, you're not done. There's so much more we have to do. In fact, I was just talking to one of our earliest critical engineers. He's like, Eric, the roadmap has never been thicker, richer, deeper more options, mm -hmm. you know, and the team's executing well. And I think as long as there's customers who like the product, that you're delivering new functionality, that the roadmap is thick and people want it and people are liking it, you're not done, right? Yeah. I think the problem would be if the company ever started to, you know, you know, you know I mean, on the financial side, that, that users started losing enthusiasm or there was that lack of yeah. that really positive, our roadmap is almost extensively driven by customer input that just love the product. Mm -hmm. They love yeah. it and they said, damn it, but just, please Eric, can you make it do this? And we have so much to do. Yeah. I think people just react to that, right? They, they come to work in the morning because there's just, there's so mm -hmm. much stuff that people need done. Mm -hmm. And that's not always true in the companies I've been in. You sort of hit that stall point where you don't exactly know what to do. Maybe you need to pivot or maybe you're running out of stuff. In our case, it's just getting, the pipeline's getting bigger and thicker and richer. I, I, and, I think also, like, e even from, from the days that we were doing research when it was just a few of us doing cold calls, I mean, just to figure out whether we even had an idea that made sense, that we were starting to build you know, we, we wanted to build this company to, to last, not to be a flash in the pan, not to be something which was two years and then got acquired by Google, but really a company that was built to last, a new mm -hmm. kind of company that had legs. Yeah. We've been and, acquired before and it sucks. Yeah, it and sucks. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't fall. You know, we're very fortunate that, uh, that the way we built it turned out. I mean, it turned out the way that we wanted it to. Right. Right. Yeah. So they're, they're giving us the, the signal over there on the other side of the control mm -hmm. desk. So just to kind of close, what, what, you've been living for 10 years. What are some of the, your favorite customer success stories, your favorite customer uses of, of Splunk that you just would have no idea that either somebody would think to use it that way or that the relationships uh, that they were able to, to query uh, were just so fantastic that, wow, you know, what, what a fantastic tool of discovery as we are on the data discovery. I was doing a homebrew kit yesterday. That's cool. I haven't, I haven't home, heard mon that monitoring one. Monitoring homebrew. Seriously. Uh, monitoring a homebrew yeah. kit yeah, with yeah. I like that. Yeah. Anything, well, with, anything with yeast business. is good. Yeah. Rob's uh, Rob makes wine, so. <laughs> how, many, how many data sources does he have on the, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I on the, bo the boiling keg back in the kitchen, hopefully? Um, there was one, there was one uh, person that we talked to who was using it to monitor and create a feedback loop inside of a greenhouse environment, monitoring things like moisture and humidity, and then controlling the, the, the louvers that let the air in based on, on what it saw. So having the, the software actually make decisions on, on how to control the environment based on the feedback it was getting from the sensors. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool. I think um, what Nest Labs is doing with the thermostat data is incredibly cool. I think that the, the idea of, of taking, of putting sensors on everything, everything that, everything that you touch in 10 years from now will have sensors on it. We're working with car companies, yeah. airplane companies, uh, power generation companies. It's, it's, you know, we started out in the data center and that was cool. But it's really, it, it, that was the first mountain. The next mountain is there's this whole world beyond servers that is just about everything else you touch, right? It's just, it's everything else on the planet that's somehow physically a device. And we're seeing every day new use cases of people, whether they're people rolling tractors and they're doing, as Rob said, as the tractor's rolling, it's collecting data. Whether it's uh, delivery trucks that have mounted sensor devices and they're capturing 
weather data, uh, climate information, uh, travel time, and they're just saving it. They don't even know why yet. They're just like, okay. Uh, I think the use case that Godfrey um, mentioned in the keynote today right, with the, the Japanese elevators. people that are yep. doing elevators. the elevator is probably the most stunning use case I've heard of in the last year. It may, it may turn out that that's a great <laughs> economic indicator and no one ever looked at it. Yeah. Right. Lots of hospital, hospital beds that are now throwing off data that we're working with. So there's some really cool, it's not just servers and data centers, it's, right. it's all the other stuff that we've got going on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a big, big day that really touches every industry. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it's obviously a great business to be in. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, you've got more things to do, and as kind of more and more devices, devices you never thought before might be, uh, you know, equipped with sensors. That's another data source. Mm -hmm. that just increases the possibilities of things you can do. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Cool. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate you making time. I know you guys are probably very busy here at uh, Dot Com 2012. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, we appreciate it anyway. <laughs> so this is Jeff Kelly with Wikibon.org. We are at Dot Com 2012, Splunk's user conference. Want to thank Splunk, of course, for having us here. Uh, really appreciate it. Bring you two uh, full days of live coverage of the event. Uh, again, I'm Jeff Kelly with Wikibon.org. My co-host, Jeff Frick, from SiliconANGLE. And uh, we're going to wrap up the day shortly. Uh, we'll be back with one more segment, uh, kind of giving, your, giving you our final thoughts on the day, and then uh, previewing tomorrow uh, and the interviews we'll have for, uh, for tomorrow. So thanks a lot, and please stick around. <laughs>